Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. Borag Thung, Earthlets. Uh, look at this. Another episode in 2023 of the 2080 Thrillcast. I mean, no one's more shocked than me. Um, so, welcome to the galaxy's greatest podcast, the 2080 Thrillcast, and I am your host, Molchar. It's definitely only been two weeks since our last episode. We're definitely on track. Yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, all the uh, kind words that people have had about the, the Thrillcast over the last little while, saying how nice it's back. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I we listened to uh, to the episode with Jonathan Stroud and just really uh, really enjoyed uh, revisiting that because uh, yeah absolutely fascinating and again check out Lockwood and Co if you've not done so already so we've got uh, two parts to this episode uh, this time which is uh, well the first one is uh, I mean you've listened to the Thrillcast and so you must have picked up a copy of Best of 2000 AD Volume 1. Uh, incredible success. There was an article on Popverse uh, just the other day about how uh, we were taken by surprise about how successful it was. And it's true. I, we, you know, we, we expected it to be a success, but we didn't necessarily know it would be such a, a, a bestseller for us, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, volume 1 sold out before it, it even saw... Uh, publication day um, so uh, that went into reprint volume 2 has done very well, volume 3 is coming out soon, incredible covers and all power to the elbow of my colleague Owen Johnson who's the brains behind uh, that particular operation but back in New York Comic Con uh, in October uh, there was uh, a panel uh, about Best of 2000 AD where it was uh, uh, friends of the Phil cast, uh, Chloe Maville, Graham McMillan and uh, comics critic Tiffany Babb in conversation with Owen and also uh, 2000 AD writer Arthur Wyatt talking about bringing the Best of 2000 AD to the state. And what's been really interesting and something highlighted in the Popverse article is about how... Uh, Sales in the uh, sales have been greater in the US for this than in the UK. So there's very clearly a hunger for this kind of jumping on uh, title over there, which is uh, fantastic to see. So um, uh, we have a recording of uh, that panel where they discuss 2080, the impact in the States and the impact of Best of 2080, which is uh, wonderful. And then the second half is um, just uh, it's some rando uh, talking about his book. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's me uh, talking about I Am The Law. Uh, this is my book about um, Judge Dredd and policing and politics over the last 50 years, law and order politics, zero tolerance policing, the surveillance state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, again, a title that sold out before it had even seen publication. So uh, we're eagerly awaiting the uh, reprint of that. And thank you to everyone who's picked up a copy or come along to one of the events. Um, it's been it's been so wonderful to see uh, the reaction to two years of my work. So, you know, thank you all around. Um, so uh, we hear again from Graham McMillan interviewing me on my own podcast, which is a little surreal. Um, so, uh, again, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, and uh, I, I must very much mention that uh, if you go along to the Rebellion store, uh, which is uh, Rebellion's main uh, website store, you are now able to order prints uh, of 2000 AD and Judge Dredd magazine covers. Uh, these come in two different sizes. Uh, we, I, I mean, really great quality prints. Um, so uh, yeah, when when you know you look at an edition of 2000 AD covers uncovered, you look at it, you go, oh yeah, actually that looks quite nice. I'd love to have my, uh, that on my wall. You now can have that on your wall thanks to the Rebellion store. And um, there's links in on our social media and in the thrill mail and and everything. So uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. So uh, I'm going to stop prattling on and we're going to crack on with this episode. So. As I said, the first is a recording of uh, Graham McMillan, Clomaville, Tiffany Babb, Arthur Wyatt, and our own Owen Johnson at New York Comic Con in October, talking about Best of 2000 AD. Are we recording? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Everyone in the audience. 
thank you for coming here at 7.45 on a Friday evening when there are many other things you could be doing, including not being at a comic convention. Uh, this is the Best of 2080 Bringing Britain's Finest Stateside Panel. Uh, the title is the work of Chloe, who's right next to me. My name is Graham McMillan, I'm a staff writer for Poppers, which is at thepoppers.com. Uh, and I am the least important person on this panel because I am the moderator. You do not come to hear me speak, you can hear these two people speak, and maybe a fourth if he arrives. Oh, he's on his panel. way. He's on his way, so you can, there will be four other people. You can applaud him when he comes in, and then you can just a little bit guilty for being late. Um, anyways, starting with Chloe, let's go down and you can all introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Chloe Mabiel. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I am the editor in chief of the Gutter Review and kind of just uh, an all around uh, British comics wonk, <laughs> accidentally. Um, I'm Owen Johnson, and I'm the series uh, editor for Best of 2000 AD, and I do sales uh, at Rebellion as well. Uh, my pronouns are he, here. Hi, my name is Tiffany Babb, um, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm deputy editor of Poppers, founder of Poppers.com. <laughs> Tiffany's my boss, even though I'm the moderator. Not it's really. going to be from awkward conversations. And then uh, Arthur Wyatt. And Arthur Wyatt will be here. Uh, he writes Judge Dredd. <laughs> there's a microphone for you to talk into. Oh, and Arthur Wyatt will also be showing up at some point, and he writes Judge Dredd. Thank you for the person for me. Um, I have a question to start with. How many of you here have read 2018? Arthur's right there, I can see him in the back. Yay. Wrong room, Arthur! Wrong room! <laughs> <laughs> Spectacular. None of you could see it you're facing the wrong direction, but Arthur just went in the room opposite. Hey. Oh, round of applause, please, for Arthur. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to be punk rock. <laughs> is, that a, is this punk rock? I can't, I can't <laughs> love that. Um, yeah, sorry, how many people here have read 2008? How many people are familiar with 2008? You're sharing Bless mind. all of you um, for that. 2008 is uh, 45 years old. It has been running in the UK since 1977. It is uh, kind of a mystery here in the States, which is really unusual because if you take away 2008, you don't really have the last 40 years of American comics. 2008 is where Alan Moore came from. 2008 is where Brian Bowen came from, where Ian Gibson came from, where a large number of comic Grand creators Morrison. who have changed the face of American comics got started. Um, and yet, in part because of the way that British comics work, in part of the way because American comics work, Americans haven't really had an opportunity to experience it. Hence, Best of 2008. Until you now. Yeah, you <laughs> best of 2008, Volume 1. This is just been published. I'm watching at the show this weekend. So. Um, oh, and as the person who put this together, why don't you talk about what Best of 2008 is meant to be? Why does this thing exist? Yes. Um, so, uh, the whole idea with Best of 2080 is that it's um, essentially a greatest hits or a big um, mixtape. We've given it the subtitle, The Essential Gateway into the Galaxy's Greatest Comic. Um, and the idea is very much like a lot of comics, when you come to this giant um, universe, it can be incredibly overwhelming. Um, you know, and a question that kept coming over again and again and again um, is uh, both with readers, both in the US or you know, anywhere is, where do I start with that? Like, where do I even begin? Um, and so the idea is that with this is very much, um, this is the gateway, you know, into the entire world. There'll be a sampling of everything, um, uh, lots of different properties and lots of different kinds of stories because there's quite a little uh, breadth of tone in 2080. Um, the idea is to collate all these things over these six volume books so you can try it um, and, and decide what you, you know, find basically your new favorite comic book. For people who aren't familiar with 2008, the way I tend to describe it to people who are more familiar with American comics or, or just comics that are available in America is, it's kind of British manga. Mm -hmm. uh, 2008 is stories that are told in serialized weekly forums and then collected into collected editions. Um, which is kind of off-putting for a lot of American readers who are used to one comic coming out every you know, month for 20 pages. Um, but also the subject matter of 2008 <laughs> stories is not 
very familiar to a lot of American readers. Think more um, image comics, science fiction, and horror than, than superhero titles. These aren't Marvel and DC books at all. These are a totally different thing. Um, best of 2008. Oh, and why do you talk about what's in volume one to sort of give sure. people an idea of the sort of stories that you're dealing with? Yeah, so every single volume has a te uh, the whole series has a template. So in every single volume, you're going to get a chunk of Judge Dredd at the beginning that's essentially a modern story. Um, and it's completely self-contained, it's essentially a case. So you don't have to know any continuity or anything like that. So you're going to get a little bit of dread straight up. Um, and then uh, after that, you're going to get a mixture of some short hidden gems. Um, in the first volume, there's uh, Brink, um, which is a modern series, a science fiction detective. Uh, uh, it's kind of been described as true detective in space, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, high concept, um, and that's by uh, Dan Abnett and Ian J. Colbert. Um, you've got the entire first volume of The Ballad of Halo Jones, um, which is Alan Moore's first um, masterpiece. Essentially, he did all, that, all of the work um, on it um, uh, prior to you know, going over to the States and working over there. Um, we've got Strongium Dog, The Sad Case. Uh, you have an essay, and there'll be an essay that prefaces the uh, feature presentation, um, which is a full, one like 100 page full length graphic novel. Um, and you get that uh, in every volume. And this one is uh, Judge Anderson, Shambhala, um, which is by Alan Grant and Arthur Ranson. You get a little bit of a dread from like the deep archive, of, like an old vintage dread. Um, and then we end out with uh, DR and Quinch, one page. Yeah. Um, I should say the, the essays you're talking about, two of the people on this panel have contributed essays to this book. Um, <coughs> your essay, I think, appears first. Uh, you're writing about the Leviathan. I am. I did write about Leviathan. Yes. Why don't you explain what Leviathan is? Leviathan is a story about a ship that has gone sailing, a Titanic like ship, if you might want to say. And it has started sailing and it never stopped. And kind of what happens to the society that devolves on the ship, right? What happens to first class and second class and third class? What are the new societies that are built? Um, when crime happens, who comes and investigates? And it's following a man who is investigating what looks to be like a serial killer crime and where that leads him, which is dark. I'm going to say Junji Ito, but is it Junji Ito? Mm -hmm. yes. I, apparently, uh, the people on here yeah. disagree with me. Um, Chloe, you're doing the essay in volume four or five, I believe, and you were writing about a very different type of Yes, um, extremely different from the uh, horrors of Leviathan. I got to do uh, Hugh Ligon's haircut, uh, which is uh, Peter Milligan and uh, Tank Girl's Jane Hewlett, and it is an impossibly stupid story done really smartly. Um, it's a, it's a, a guy named Hugh who is in a mental institution and they deem him sane. Good job. But before that, he gets a hold of some of the NHS safety scissors and gives himself a haircut, uh, which opens a portal in his pompadour. And he is then kind of transported into this super psychedelic, um, really trippy world where he meets his love interest, Scarlet O'Gas Meter. And uh, they kind of go through this weird... I don't even know how to really describe it. This weird <laughs> psychedelic uh, kind of anti-establishment sort of adventure that doesn't really have an aim. It's just Milligan and Hewlett having a really, really good time. They're letting, um, the id ha uh, the, they're letting that kind of id hang out yeah. on page to a degree. Right? Um, uh, I described it in my essay as being very visual Britpop. Uh, it's very out there and very loud and has uh, kind of a message, but who knows what that message actually is. Um, but in the process, it's very trippy and it's very uh, colorful and it's arguably one of the most beautiful books put together. Um, so that's just overall thrilling. Jamie Hewlett is, of course, also the person named Gorillas. Yeah. So you can be familiar with them from that as well. Um, those are two very different types of stories. And then Arthur. Uh, you write Judge Dredd, and Judge Dredd is in all of these books. Why don't you explain the concept for Judge Dredd that for people who are unfamiliar? Oh, sort of explain again how broad 2000 actually is. So, I mean, I think pretty much everyone is familiar with Judge Dredd from the, the 2012 movie. Uh, if they are not, then check that out. It pretty much lays out the basics. It's a cop who is 
very extreme, at the same time exploring the concepts behind that. Um, to me, kind of goes a bit more into the philosophical slash political side of that, um, which actually the um, story that's in uh, in the uh, best of hits at the very interesting point. Um, it hits just before um, *Jury Duty*, which is one of my favorite stories um, in the whole 2080 direction of plays out after there's basically lessening in the city that um, Judge Red inhabits laws to allow mutants a little bit more freedom, um, which does not go well. Um, and I will let you guys read that to see how that goes, but <laughs> it is a favorite of mine. Um, Owen, when you're faced with almost half a century worth of material, that is incredibly broad and incredibly varied in terms of everything, in terms of tone, in terms of execution, in terms of style. How do you choose what goes on a best of? Pretend you're not massively underqualified for the job. <laughs> um, and you talk to people, that's the best thing about working in a team and is working with other people. Um, a little bit of context, if you wind the clock back to about 2017, that's kind of where part of the genesis of this even began is that far back. I got hired at um, Rebellion um, to direct a one-day convention for the fans called the uh, 40th anniversary of Thrill Power. Um, and it was in London and we did it and it was absolutely amazing. Prior to that, I hadn't read much 2008 beyond some Titan um, reprints of Halo Jones and Zenith and things like that. So I, w I wasn't what you'd call a diehard fan or anything like that. And then I did this show and I was walking around seeing how much it meant to people how much they loved it and how much they believed in it. And it was a real big bang for me of like, wow, this is really important and it's really special. Um, and so it meant that then I went and started reading a bunch of stuff. Um, and I also, it's worth mentioning, I moved then into the sales side. Um, and I did a load of US sales. I did training with Titan before I got the job Rebellion. And that was a lot of, and I really love the direct market. I love the US comic market, which is obviously, you know, um, we've been making great gains at, um, you know, with the books distributed you know, through American comic stores and things like that. So I was wanting to do more stuff in the States. I did a bunch of things like the ALA. I did a lot of Diamond Retail Summits where you talk to librarians. Shows like this where I talk to fans, um, either that are new to it, like maybe some of you, or diehards. And then, as well as you having to sell the stuff and say, this is why this is important and why you should enjoy it, you also have to listen. Um, that's kind of part of the thing as well and one thing we kept hearing again and again was I don't know where to start and that's kind of the genesis of us starting to say how do we make a product, make, make a book that could be cool on its own and that was a huge part of the process is are you reading a story that's a complete meal no continuity, you don't need to know anything and do you enjoy that then does the book work as a whole and, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of part of the process, but it's intimidating. I haven't read absolutely everything. Um, and there's guys in the office I trust that they have their own taste, so there's some of their favorite stories. Um, you know, I have a couple of people you know, outside that are friends that have maybe read it for years and years and years. Some that have read literally nothing. And you gauge what works. What works and what doesn't, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the idea. Arthur, when did you start reading? I'm trying, because Owen just said that he basically came to this fresh five years ago. Are you and I the people who've been reading for the longest? I being started old reading British? with the old school Best of 2000 AD. So literally <coughs> the Best of 2000 AD that was either the first or second, I think it had the VCs in it. And so you're talking like three decades ago. Three decades ago. Just to make us sound old. Rude of you to age him on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very old. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, but like you and I grew up with this. Yeah. And I think it's important to point out that 2080, as was, like when, when you and I were reading, was a kid's comic. Yeah. It, it was an intentionally for boys of, of what would you say, like a, I mean, early teens? 11 or 12, I suspect the people who are writing it were writing it for the people who are writing it, and the people who are drawing it were drawing it for themselves. But yeah, theoretically, it was a boys comic for sort of teen boys. 
And as you know, as boys of the era, like I remember, it worked. Like it, it did do everything I wanted it to do. It was science fiction. It was horror. But I said it was appropriate for for kids our age who, which means like it's not really appropriate for kids your age. It's actually <laughs> like aimed a little bit older than you, but you really want to read that stuff. You know, you're you're reading things that you don't quite understand, but are creepy or are exciting because they are sort of illicit. But I have to point out that like one of the things with this new best of that I I think is kind of wonderful is it is not at all a retro piece. No, it's yeah. it's you know yeah. Brink, which is, takes up a, a yeah. significant portion. Yeah. We'll, we'll probably talk about Brink in a bit, but you know I can talk about Brink for hours. But, yeah, no, um, we can make this into the Brink panel. Everything in it is very modern, even the stuff that's sort of a bit old, like the um, there's an Alan Moore uh, Halo Jones piece, which um, has been sort of brought right up to date with the the recoloring of it. Even that reads really modern um, these days. That's kind of the thing. The two thousand has always been ahead of its time. You know, um, for for Chloe and, and Tiffany, like Tiffany, what was your first exposure to the movie? Because you you're a really recent reader, aren't you? Yes, I mean I've read bits and pieces over the years just through reading a lot of comics. I've never read 2080 like regularly. It tends to be like, oh, someone said this was good, hands it to me, I read it, and I have thoughts, right? Um, but I think. What you were saying about 2018 being really modern, in a lot of ways, it, you know how like when you're reading a parody and it's very funny, and then like five years later you like think back and like you're reading the news and you're just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's what comes across with a lot of these stories sometimes, especially when you're reading the older ones where you're just like, oh. Um, sometimes you feel like the problems of the past were quite different, and then you read them and you're like, no, they were making fun of the same BS that we have to deal with now. I, I like your censorship. For the, for the more, <laughs> I didn't know there's a there's a camera looking at us. <laughs> this is going down forever, apparently. Um, um, sorry. Yes. No. Go no, I was going to say, Chloe. I know that you were you were <laughs> you are so much of a fan that uh, you should show your arm to the audience, please. We've got Strontium Dog and Tharg and Ace Trucking Company and more Strontium Dog and Zombo and Dior and Quinch. <laughs> uh, and you, you're really and Dread, and Dread actually. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Tiffany doesn't swear, and then you 100% do. I've good, never sworn in my life. It's just Chloe. But, but like, your introduction was was also relatively recent, and then you just dived straight in. My introduction was weird, um, because I was uh, kind of raised on offbeat comics. Um, I was introduced to, like, old deadlines and stuff when I was a, a teenager, and then, of course, I grew up... Um, reading a lot of Grant Morrison and a lot of Alan Moore, as we all kind of did. Um, and then I just started down this hill of like, well, what else did they do? And you just go back and you find all these things that nobody ever talks about from these massive creators. And you go back and you're like, oh my god, this is even better than the other stuff. This is so good. Why is nobody talking about it? And then I just kind of got obsessed. Like, it's, it's just been my entire jam since then um, for the past, I don't know, probably, like, better part of a decade. It's just, I, it's just become one of my really big focuses, and um, especially running a site that focuses on comics that people don't, uh, particularly American audiences, don't talk about enough anymore or that history has kind of forgotten. Like, it's kind of become my joy and my job to just read as many of these really, really old, really obscure, and just really, really fantastic comics as I possibly can. So. I want you to talk about Dear and Quinch to people, <laughs> because Dear and Quinch is at the end of each volume, and Dear and Quinch is something that's really strange to explain to American audiences, because you guys know who Alan Moore is. Yes. And Alan Moore has written Watchmen, and he's written The Killing Joke, and he's written The Beaver Vendetta, and he's a thoughtful, sensitive writer. But what if he wrote Animal House in Space? <laughs> and that's what Dear and Quinch is. Dear Essentially. And Quinch is the dumbest, funniest thing. Yeah, um, and, it, and it is. It's two essentially like teenage aliens, uh, DR and Quinch, um, who like cruise around in their super retro space car man and like uh, try to avoid joining the military. And 
uh, throw glass bottles at planets that they don't think are worth it anymore because they're totally groovy and anti-establishment. And fire bazookas. Yeah, fire bazookas at people, and then Quinch's mom has to come and save them, and she's like 700 stories tall and giant and pink, and it's very, very good. Um, but it's really fun. Things like things like Dear and Quinch are kind of perfect because it's this creator that you think is this super, super serious thing. And he was writing the goofiest shit back in the day. It was so strange. And and, and honestly, Halo Jones kind of does that too, where it's um, a surprisingly feminist comic from a a very young Alan Moore, uh, which not not everybody thinks of Alan Moore as being a very feminist comic writer. And and you do get that side. Um, You do get that side of him, and you get this, this goofy silliness that people just don't don't recognize, and it's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah, well, please start <laughs> pitching your website. Yeah, right. <laughs> so one of the amazing things about uh, Dion and Quinch is um, it, it basically all came from a five pager that mm-hmm. Alan Moore did on basically on a whim. Like it, it was so throwaway, and yet people loved it, and then it ended up being this this big thing, and just rolled and rolled. Um, that's kind of one of the things that's great about 2000 AD is that uh, it can really act as this sort of incubator for ideas and you can have something that's in a sort of five page format. They do these things called future shocks, which are, are like basically short one and done stories with a twist, which uh, I, I believe D.R. and Quinch started either as one of those or a time twister, which is mm-hmm. essentially the same It's thing. a future shock with a different name. Yeah. It has time travel, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he took that, uh, it was popular, he ran with it, and it ended up playing this this whole thing, which is, you know, genuinely one of my favorite things that 2000 AD mm-hmm. has run. It, it sounds like a, a cliche because 2000 AD got started in 1977 when punk was breaking through in the UK. But 2000 AD is a punk approach to comics in that there's a certain number of pages of comics that appear every week, but you don't always know what those comics are going to be. And sometimes you see people just being playful in a way that, again, you can't really do in American comics, where everything has its own comic. You know, if there's a comic about X-Men coming out, you know the X-Men are going to be in there. But in 2008, they you know, can and have done things where they basically lie to the reader about what the story is. And then midway through it would be like, Sorry, it's actually a Judge Dredd story, as we never told you, and we've also been lying about who the writer is. And it's this thing that you actually started reading three months ago and you didn't realize. I hope you're okay with that. They did a crossover between three different serials that they didn't tell anyone about ahead of time. And it only worked if you read the issue straight through. If you didn't, you'd think, why is he kicking in the door and why does the story end there? And why does this other story start with someone kicking in the door? But if you read the whole thing through, straight through, you're like, oh, they're they're telling the same story and they never told us. And um, you get the Future Shocks, which is, I mean, the Future Shocks is a lovely format because it's also how you get new creators. Grant Morrison comes from Future Shocks. One of Neil Gaiman's first comic series is a Future Shock. Uh, Grant, uh, Alan Moore did a lot of Future Shocks. And it's a wonderful training tool for writers and artists because you have five pages to tell a story, go. And you have to tell a complete story. Beginning, middle, and end, and you're not continuing. That uh, trifecta story you mentioned, only two of the writers on that are the best X-Men writers right now. Oh yeah, because Al, <laughs> Al Ewing and Seth Burry are also yeah. right for 2000 AD. Again, there's, 2000 AD is an incubator of who you're going to be reading in American comics five years from now. That's pretty much baseline. If there's someone that you're really enjoying in 2000 AD, it's very likely they're going to end up working in America. I was, well, what, what I was looking over. Well, I was I was just going to say like a lot of people remember the Batman run from the 1990s with Alan Grant, and I mean he's responsible for so much of the history of 2080. Yeah, he was like, an editor then, right? Yeah, and 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 uh, it's creators like that, or uh, Simon Bisley, who is actually here at the show, uh, weirdly enough, uh, and. Like he did uh, Lobo. Everybody loves the Lobo from the 90s because it was so incredibly chaotic. And like he got his start in 2080 as well. It's all of these really, really incredible creators who, um, I mean, we were just doing kind of an allegrant retrospective earlier talking about how so many portions of how um, comics were comics were handled for particularly DC in the 90s 
come from this pillar that Alan Grant built on you have to be able to get people to understand the comic that you are writing in one issue. Can somebody pick up this comic right now and know exactly the story that they are reading? Can they know the character? Can they know the themes? Can they know all of this stuff in one concrete thing? And then they're going to want to come back and read more. But if they don't, and it's their first time reading it, that's okay too. And I think that that comes so much from the format of, of British comics. And, and honestly, like Future Shocks too. It's you have to tell the story. Tell the story, tell it concretely, make it entertaining, and you get to move on. I was just, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I was going to add as well. A lot of those guys um, were, you know, workmen as well. They were, yeah. they were craftsmen essentially. So you get like the lightning in a bottle of 2000 AD when it kind of launches. Um, but those writers often, like, in the same way that um, is the same, you know, in the states where you know when you had re- westerns and your romance mm-hmm. stuff and the original, like the Joe Simon and the Jack Kirby stuff. These guys are trained in as in as many interesting ways of making drama out of anything already so that when they really vibe on stuff they really really like they're already like firing on all cylinders you know this is a good place to bring in Judge Dredd because the flip side of this is Judge Dredd which is unlike anything in American comics because it is a story that started in the second issue of 2008 in 1977 and continues to stay and has been running every week ever since that all of it is in canon all of it is being told in real time and all of it has impact on each other. There are stories being told now that are rooted in something that happened in 1980. But none of it is being done in a way that is uh, forcing people to go back and read the old stuff. All of it is being told with the expectation of, you might not know any of this, so we will tell you. It's a soap opera in comics, which sounds ridiculous about, you know, it's the future and it's a fascist space call. But it is... (laughs) Yeah, I, I like him to realize some spirit. You know, it's it's the spirit being told in the science fiction concept. It is the most ambitious thing in English language comics. And the fact that people do not recognize it as such, honestly, is kind of their fault. Because this material is always in there. Arthur, you're writing Judge Red now. Like I have one this week. Yeah, like, I have one this time. week. I am attempting to destroy the entire concept of Judge Red in, in this week, so that's ambitious. Um, <laughs> that said, um, will it succeed? Who knows? Um, I mean, there's going to be a, a story next month, so next week, so probably not. I mean, that's just a kind of interesting thing, is it runs every week, uh, and every week it's going to be something different. It covers an astonishing range of styles. Like, um, last week actually was a story by me, myself as well, uh, which I wrote a while ago, which is this sort of comedy piece. Um, and, and that fits right in as well as this sort of this week's, which I wrote with Rob Williams, which is sort of more a serious, sort of almost political piece. Well, dread is everything. Dread is it some of the funniest stars. comedy you've ever read, some of the sharpest political satire you could imagine some of the most tragic stories you can imagine well because again this strip has to be everything because it's continuing for 45 years and deepening the characters it's in, it's like it sounds a bit pretentious but um that's my vibe and um, it, it's a bit it's a cultural organism that that's what i find really interesting about the strip is that you know there's a whole story of like uh, John and Alan just sitting there at the weekend making a cup of tea and they just they'd spread out the newspapers and just be like okay what have we got this week? And they would build all the stories from that, and um, and all the writers and artists, you know, including Arthur, are, are doing that pretty much every every week. And that, and it's reflect constantly reflective, not only of where we're going, but also you know where we're living in now, and that's really special. I say this very weird. That sounds like makes Judge Dredd sound really scary because I'm like, oh, it's a 45 year story, and everything counts. And people are like, I'm never going to pick that up because I have to read 45 years worth of stories. The fun thing about it is. It doesn't rely on that. You can have standalones, you can have things where they're rooted in the past, but it doesn't expect you to know that. But you will also then go back and read old material and go, oh, it's him. Then that means the story I've read is entirely different from what I thought it was when I was reading it the first time. It's really interesting because there's a, there's another example that isn't kind of long though, which is old, ongoing newspaper strips, right? Mm-hmm. Just where every day, 
it could be a new reader, but the plot is ongoing, so there's this balance between creating something new and interesting to keep up with people. Um, I was interviewing, gosh, I'm forgetting their name right now. Who's on Heart of the City? Steens. Steens, thank you, Steens. I was interviewing Steens <laughs> recently, and they were talking about how they do Sunday strips and daily strips, and Sunday strips have to be separate because not everybody gets a Sunday paper in color, right? And so having this balance of the daily strip might have a plot that the Sunday strip can't follow, and vice versa, right? So there's this kind of, I don't want to say soft storytelling, because it's, it's very complicated, but it's a light handle on the mythos, almost, that is really interesting. And what you were saying earlier about almost every, not a genre, but every form of story appears because you're doing it for so long and you know you don't want this week to look like last week's and the one to week look the week the same as the week before. You want to have surprise. You want to bring kind of life into it because it's ongoing, because it's constantly ongoing. Arthur, I'm going to pick on you again for a second. Okay. How do you as a writer approach drives knowing that you have this history behind you? And I'm simultaneously respecting it and not being beholden to it. I mean, it, it honestly probably takes an enormous amount of ego from me because, you know, <laughs> Judge Dredd originally is the creation of John Wagner, who has not really been like a big profile writer in uh, the US, but like in the UK, it's basically the writer. Um, every UK comic of any kind of significance, uh, John Wagner was probably touched. Um, any UK comic of any significance that John Wagner hasn't touched, uh, Pat Mills has touched, who was the second writer on, on Judge Dredd. So it, it is something that really comes from this sort of hugely significant background um, where people have just been sort of building it up week after week, and, and also with the magazine month after month. So there's like two separate titles sort of building this, this story up. Um, I think what helps is it's kind of segued into this moment where there is a very established character and a very established universe, and if you've been following that um, since childhood, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of possible to know what is right and what is wrong for that setting, and you, you kind of get a very good sense of, like, I'm writing something, this fits in right away. Uh, I wouldn't say it immediately gives you the ability to write stuff that's right for it, but if it's wrong for it, kind of no. Um, uh, the other thing that's sort of a huge help with, um, with, with writing for it is there's, there's been this sort of whole community uh, around the character. So, you know, I, I, I have had a lot of help over the years with other writers who worked on 2000 VD. So, um, Gordon Ray, particularly, I've chatted with a lot. Um, Mike Bolger has not wrote, written for it, but has written the book on it. And uh, I strongly urge everyone to check out a chapter from that book at the 2008 East End. Um, I have a lot of chats with him. All of that has just sort of informed the, the take on the, the character that I, I have. Um, uh, at the end of the day, um, it's a very collective process. I don't want to say nothing is wrong that you put into it, because clearly, you know, there's a right way and there's a wrong way, but I think you're all working together to sort of move this thing forward. And I, I'd also add that that's not just the writers on that, that's also the artists, artists who have been like a huge set of contributors over the years. Chloe, I'm going to put you in the spotlight, mm. because uh, Arthur just no. Sort of made the point of like if you've been reading this stuff long enough, you know what a Judge Dredd story is. Mm -hmm. And I think I think anyone who's been reading 2000 AD for a significant period of time knows what 2000 AD is. But I think everyone's answer would be really different. Mm -hmm. What is 2000 AD for you? Oh God. Mm -hmm. Um. Before yeah. the panel, not, not said, a big deal. Don't apparently. ask me an open-ended question. And so I thought, what would be fun is including Chloe on the spot with an open-ended question. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really... <laughs> Shut up, Oh, you're next, don't worry. I'm going to um, I think it's really hard. I think that, that it's, um, 
again, it's, it's 45 years of history. This almost half a it's century. It's explosions and dinosaurs. Yeah, it is, it is also that. But it's, um, I think it's, I think it's sci-fi as the entertaining thing that it's meant to be. I know that that, that, that seems really um, uh, reductive, actually, but it's... it's Stand behind yourself. I'm, I'm trying. Um, it's, uh, it is, but it is. It's an intimidating question to ask because there's so much history and there's so many different genres uh, of like sci-fi, uh, like sub-genres <laughs> that fit under the 2080 umbrella. But ultimately, like I do think that it is very, it is very um, character-driven, history-driven sci-fi uh, done in a way that is just not being done and hasn't really been done elsewhere. And it is con continuously entertaining. You're never going to find um, a 2008 e title, whether it is just astonishingly objectively good, or some of them, some of the older ones, like just a camp nightmare of bad. Um, but it's never, but yeah, Shaco, the uh, bear wanted by the CIA. Uh, the tagline for Shaco really is the only bear on the CIA death list. Yeah. And that is the way they write the story. And There's a bear that the CIA are trying to kill because he's that deadly. Yeah, because he swallowed a rate. It's it's a lot, yeah. but it's <laughs> like, um, but I think ultimately, like you're, it's it might be good, it might be bad, it might like, uh, but it is always going to be entertaining. There is not one single 2080 title that I can think of that is not in some way entertaining. So that's it. It's sci-fi as the most entertaining version of the genre that you can think of. Arthur, you said explosions and dinosaurs. Is that I mean, actually what I would say <laughs> about 2000 AD as a sort of defining thing is like an its start in the 1970s, it was not supposed to be good. There was no yeah. reason it should be good. And yet people came along and just gave it 1,000% the, the job of they should have and created this amazing thing. And then the next generation of uh, writers and artists that came along after that just kind of picked up the baton and ran with that and, and made this incredible thing. So it's kind of freakish that it's as good as it is, and that it sort of came out of this sort of background of you know basically someone in 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 nineteen seventies British boys comics saying why don't you make something that's sort of like Star Wars? Yeah, Star Wars is going to be popular. Why don't you yeah. make Star Wars? Just make it Star Wars, and then this incredible thing just grows out of that. It's like forty five years of committing to the bit. That's actually a better answer. <laughs> uh, just when you said dinosaurs reminded me, 2008 invented Jurassic Park like 20 years before Jurassic Park came along. But there really is a 2008 story about what if we cloned dinosaurs and made it into a theme park. 2008 likes to predict the future in stupid ways like that. Or there's a president, Donald Trump, like five years before Trump was elected. And it's played as a joke because, you know, reality hates us and it wasn't a joke in real life. But like, 2008 does keep saying, this is the future, you know, ironically for a comic that is now literally 22 years out of date, it, it, is, it is about the future. Owen, you're yeah. going to say something. No, no, um, I was just going to say, um, I, um, in terms of like, like you said about the Star Wars thing, there is a certain element in some of the early stuff, I love Hubjaw, but essentially just about a giant shark with this like, Jab, uh, harpoon stuck in his mouth. They're just but, but Jaws was going to be big. This is it. Jaws was going to be big. So they were like, look, there's <laughs> loads of kids that aren't going to be able to get into Jaws. So we're going to do a comic where there's that everyone's just getting mauled by this thing, and we're going to release it, and everyone lapped up because they couldn't go and see the movie. And um, that's just uh, the fun part of it. But like you said about music um, earlier, and, and obviously there's the Hugh Hecker and the Britpop like link, um, and obviously it fits in with the, the mixtape idea. Um, there, there is just something about, um, like you mentioned, punk, of the idea of if um, lots of it, although it is playful, can be angry. Um, the satirical element is huge. Yeah, I think it's born out of a lot of frustration that was happening in the 70s. Um, I think that's why it's still very relevant. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but it's not going great in the UK at the minute. Um, uh, it's, everyone's still very angry about lots of different kinds of things. Some of that stuff is really still very under the surface. And so you mentioned anarchy as well. And those kind of things, I, you know, we found in looking, what are the defining traits from all this stuff? Um, those kind of words, you know, use. Um, 
the intensity of it. It's like an electric jolt. You know. I'm giving you a fast forward to all the panelists. I'm going to ask you to name your favorite two days in the beach trip in a minute. But first of all, I'm going to distract Tiffany by asking another, another question. Why would you do this to me? Because you're my boss and it's the one time I get to do something like this to you. No, no, I did want to mention, um, I just wanted to give a shout out um, to the, the critics that have written some of the essays that we've got going in. Um, and, you know, I, you've hinted about, you know, not reading a huge amount of 2008. That's not a problem. That's the reason a lot of the critics um, that we talked to, because we wanted not necessarily people who knew everything about their theory. The point was, I wanted to um, bring you guys in because you're really good. For, you have really great voices. You really know comics. You really love comics, um, and you just like really, really good storytelling. And I felt like we needed um, voices of people that that didn't know stuff. You know. As deep dive, because I'm 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 one of those people as well, um, and it's about that hand we shine going. This is something cool. This is something fresh, um, and I kind of trusted that you're all talented enough to, you know, stick the landing. And it, everyone, everyone surprised me and um, brought something to the table that um, was fresh and interesting, and, and made this stuff relevant to people. So. That was very nice, and softens the blow, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, earlier on, I, I likened to that movie to, to image comics to manga. Like you were, you were well versed in a lot of different types of comics. Like, what do you think it's closest to in the American market? Like, for for an American newcomer that's coming to do that movie, like, where would you say are the, the obvious signposts? This is going to be a weird one, but Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please explain. Like. It's that kind of energy. It's that kind of. I think a lot of what stands out to me um, with the 2080 stories that I've read, so, which tend to be the famous ones, right, are the fact that they're all responding to a cultural moment, not just thematically, but also aesthetically, right? We've got big guns, we've got big muscles, we've got all of this stuff, and that's kind of what Kevin Eastman was doing, right? It was. Like, in hindsight, it all makes sense, but at the time, you're like, it's a teenage mutant ninja turtle, like, what, it sounds silly. In the same way, a lot of, like, Judge Dredd, like, you look at the image without historical context, and you're like, well, what? Um, and I think that's the thing. It's, it's kind of what you were talking earlier about what 2000 AD is. What I, as a non-expert and a person who is not qualified to answer this specific question, Think it is, is this is what makes you qualified to answer this particular question. <laughs> um, it's genre, it's, it's leaning into the explosive side of genre um, through the like through excess, right? We're going as excessive as we can, not ignoring thematic elements, not ignoring the moment. There's a lot of history in it. When you're reading it, you tend to immediately know when it was written. <laughs> because you're like, okay, oh, yeah, you're responding to that thing sometimes. Um, and that is something that stands out now, especially as we're getting nothing against elevated genre. I love an elevated horror film, right? But we are getting more of that and less of like, you know, clown chases you nowadays. Cheap thrills. Cheap thrills. And I mean that in a complimentary way. I think cheap thrills, thrills is wonderful. Um, and I think that's what 2080 celebrates is kind of, you can't have a shark with a hook sticking out of its jaw, right? And that's celebrated and that's exciting because that's pretty cool. Like if you're a kid, that is the coolest thing you've ever heard of. Um, and as an adult, that's also pretty cool, right? And you get to have these fun stories. There's, and it's, the stories aren't always fun, but the, they kind of the are. Ex the execution is, yes. is exciting. Yes, it's exciting. They're always exciting. Arthur, what's your favorite 2000 stories? Oh boy, that's... And why? That is very hard. My favorite right now is Brink, which is actually in the comic. I say that not because it's in the comic, because I just genuinely love it. It's Dan Abnett, who um, you, you guys, if you are familiar with general fiction, you may be familiar with Dan Abnett. He does a lot of Warhammer stuff. He does a lot of stuff. Uh, he did a Legion of Superheroes. But this is not the Dan Abnett we know. This is the Dan Abnett absolutely at the top of his game. Um, it's also, um, as well as Dan Abnett, um, Ian Pumba 
is the artist on it. He has this amazing style. This almost sort of sort of Lee Claire, um, very clean style, but at the same time, it's a, able to convey so much in its its cleanness. Um, he's also um, very much a contributor to the to plot and the story of. Uh, Break, which I, I think is part of why this sort of goes beyond what you know, a lot of stuff that people are familiar with with, uh, with Dan Abbott uh, have seen. This, this really brings the A game to things. It um, brings um, um, True Detective meets Alien by Lovecraft, and then it gets those. weirder. Like that's the basic line, and then it just goes bigger and weirder, and it's. For my money, the strangest kind of being published. I, I am not kidding when I say this. This is the best ongoing science fiction comic at the moment, right now, and nobody knows about it. But you will know about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tiffany, do you have a favorite, or am I putting you too much on the spot with that? I can answer with I haven't read enough to have a favorite. Um, I, but I do have one that I really like, which is one that I wrote about for Rebellion, which is called The Thirteenth Floor. Um, and kind of speaks to exactly what I was just saying was exciting myself, maybe, which is the idea that you can go with a fun concept, which is there's a robot, it will, I guess it's an AI, a computer in the building that's supposed to be helping you. But he also has this mysterious 13th floor. Like, let's say you're going to go mug someone. He'll take you up to the 13th floor and like put out your worst nightmares and chase you with a dinosaur and kill you. Um, and that's... Fun, right? That sounds like a fun concept. I would watch that movie. And the con the, the comic was really, really exciting and kind of the you know when you're kidding and you have something that like scares you? I don't know if any of you remember the movie, the T V movie Smart House, which terrified me. Um this is why I don't trust a like <laughs> I don't have a Siri in my house. You never know when they're gonna take over your house. Um and that's kind of the thing. It's that thing that grasps your imagination. You're like, well, what if I couldn't get out of the building and my building was trying to help me, but all they're just murking people all the time? And I really enjoyed that one. It, it, he's a benign AI with a holodeck who, if anyone tries to hurt the people who's living in him, he will torture them. Like, he goes hard. Uh, and the fun thing about it is, and I only realized this reading it as an adult, adult, because I read it as a kid and I was like, this is great, he's scary, look, he's turned him into a mouse, this is wonderful. And you read it back as an adult and you're like, this is also class warfare fiction, because it, he tortures the landlords who are going to throw the family out because they can't pay the rent, or he tortures the muggers who have attacked an old lady. And this flew over my head as a kid. And you realize now that it's very much about you have to protect the weakest people that you love. Which is, you know... But it's not that straightforward. Because, hmm? because he's oh, not... Oh, well, because he's also nuts. Because he's also nuts. Yeah, he also, he also starts going nuts. Which like, what's an problem. enemy, right? Especially for a computer. If you're saying, anyone that's going to stop me is going to be my enemy, and someone's like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, all of a sudden you have enemies everywhere. Have you got to the part where he decides he's a spy? I've read all of it. It goes really weird. It goes to the point where you're like, maybe you were drunk when you were writing this. But I'm still on board. part. Oh, and what are you? I love Nemesis the Warlock. It's one of my favorite. Oh my, explain Nemesis. Yeah, it's a big sort of gothic heavy metal cathedral of a story about the hero of it is essentially a galactic terrorist alien whose head inexplicably almost looks like his ship. Um, uh, who that's is, not is, is, explained. If you look at it, it should have explained. Like that's that's bad, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. an entire episode about that. That's true. That's true. <laughs> also, you can um, say he looks like a horse as well. Oh, yeah. He has horse yeah, legs for no reason. Yeah. Um, uh, and he exists in a world it, it, which is essentially the entire human race are uh, sort of intergalactic bigots that want to hunt, hunt down all aliens. But um, that was kind of the first one where... I kind of came across it and thought, this is, you know, a kind of like bordering on like a horror, it, you know, there's just a real sense of dread about the whole thing. Um, and my favorite, um, in terms of talking about like, like really fun, like explosive trash stuff, um, there's a, a Judge Dredd story called Hot Dog Run, um, which happens before a really major 
uh, storyline, which is like Block Mania and Apocalypse War, has become the, sort of the massive, you know, uh, quintessential epic. But I love it because it's just really deeply B movie and silly. <laughs> essentially, Judge Dredd uh, takes out um, teenage cadets out into the cursed earth to sort of see if they can kind of handle, um, you know, and, and they can't, and they're horribly traumatized, but there's like giant bugs, and it's, it's just a really fun read. Um, I love that story. Uh, I think overall, I've been like mulling it over as you've been kind of going down the line, and I think it's probably a Strontium Dog um, by Alan Grant, John Wagner, and largely Carlos Escara. Um And the way that I put it that has uh, also gotten me threatened before is that it's what, uh, it's what X-Men should be. And it's what X-Men has been trying to be for a really long time because Strontium Dog is essentially um, about mainly uh, Johnny Alpha, who is uh, a guy who was born under a fascist father and he is exposed to alpha radiation, which gives him radi irradiated eyes and he can see through things and all this groovy stuff. And he basically starts a mutant revolution and teams up with all of these uh, other mutants who have been mutated uh, by strontium, this, this big chemical radiation agent. And it is, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a class warfare story. It's a, um, it's a friendship story because he ends up kind of teaming up and creating his own little team uh, of the strontium dogs, the, the uh, bounty hunters. Um, and... It's just it's the it's I I don't I, I I feel very I feel a lot of feelings about Strontium Dog so it's uh, it's this perfectly contained little universe and it is this it's what happens if revolution succeeds in the best way that revolution can um, and what happens when people who are marginalized uh, are finally given their due by hook or crook and they accomplish that through humor and drama and uh, some really interesting writing mistakes, and uh, <laughs> uh, and it's just it's it's a great little comic that accomplishes a lot in the what, five six volumes that it exists in. Um, but but my runner up is Devlin Waugh, okay. Swimming in Blood, uh, in particular because it is uh, John Smith just being high camp gay, just gay. Gay, and uh, um, is a Freddie Mercury-looking character who is a bodybuilder and kills vampires for the Vatican. And oh, uh, but who's he going up against in that story? Oh gosh, the, the uh, vampires yeah. were underground. Yeah, oh yeah, in the under in the underwater Alcatraz. Uh, <laughs> Again, it, there's a lot of like trashy pulpiness that is genuinely joyful. That and it's well. it's beautifully re well written, uh, beautifully. Beautifully written, and uh, Sean Phillips. Sean Phillips. Yeah, Sean, yeah, Sean yeah, Phillips does a fully it's painted right. artwork for it, and it is astonishingly good looking. And I can't recommend it enough. I, I also want to say quickly, Devlin Moore continues now with um, Alish Cod. Alish Cod. Yeah, Alish Cod writes it, um, and it has become a very thing more Yeah. And that um, he is still an exorcist working for the Vatican. But he has a talking dildo friend. Yeah, because the dildo becomes possessed by a demon who decides that he's going to help him take down other demons. So at one point, he's swimming with a dildo strap to his head, having a conversation about how to destroy demons. It's that sort of a comic. <laughs> that was fun to pitch to our uh, book distributor in the United States, sales call. It's a fun book. <laughs> so John Smith will, will write that. At the same time, John Smith will also write something like Cradle Grave, which is like this, yeah. this wonderful, nuanced, super Body subtle. Horror. It is, it's, it's absolutely terrible. It's like a sort of British class horror thing that that is, yeah, I'd compare it to like a Ramsey Campbell or a, a Clyde Barker story. Yeah. Uh, so he'll he'll totally do that, and he'll do Devlin Walker at the same time. The short version is, if you like, yes, yeah, like, thank you. Um, if you like comics that aren't superheroes, there's probably something in to the D for you. If you like superheroes, there's also Zenith by Grant Morrison, which was <laughs> their first superhero story, and has. Arguably the greatest crisis on Earth story ever done in comics. What's your favorite? You didn't do your favorite. 
I purposely didn't because I'm the moderator and I don't have that question. Uh, one of my favorite. I really like Brink. I really like Strong Team Dog. Dread is honestly my favorite. I think Judge Dread is, over the course of the four or five years, legitimately one of the greatest things that English language comics has ever done. Um, and continues to be good, which doesn't make sense. Something should not be good continuously for 45 years. It should stop at some point, and it hasn't. No pressure off it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for complimenting you like stealthily, but yeah. yeah. I mean, like, we are writing a story that may do that, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uh, it's either a teaser, yeah. the most terrible teaser possible. <laughs> we yeah. might trash it. I, I'm working on a story with Rob Williams, which will probably be interesting on that question, and I'll say no more. <laughs> but I, if it's the story that you've sort of been hinting for a while, it's another way in which Dread is fascinating. Because, and this might be a, a totally something else that, from your Robert doing, but you've previously done a story which was basically dealing with the can you stop crying through economic redistribution. You know, which is a fascinating concept, and it's the joke about, well, if Bruce Wayne really wanted to stop crying, he would be Batman. <laughs> but you are actually dealing with it. Like, it's, it's again, something else you can do with Judge Dredd yeah, that is not shooting people. kind of set up a situation where that, that, that question has to be answered. We also, you know, spoilers looming on the horizon, people hate people who ask that question and there are consequences to asking that question so carnage Super. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, to our wonderful panellists and uh, congratulations again to Owen for uh, the success of Best of 2000 AD. If you've not picked it up, please do go along to our web shop or your local Thrill Power provider and grab a copy. It's uh, absolutely packed with the very best of thrills. Um, so next up, as I mentioned, is, uh, well, it's me uh, talking to Graham McMillan uh, about my new book, I Am The Law which is available from all good uh, book and comic book stores, as well as digitally from the 2080 app, web shop, and on Kindle. Uh, so, yeah, we talk uh, just dread, policing, um, what it's like to to write a book in the middle of a pandemic uh, with everything that's been going on in the last few years. So I uh, hope you enjoy um, uh, hearing us uh, witter on. And um, we will be back, I promise in two weeks time it's around about two weeks let's just let's let's just be a little bit vague um where we're going to be hearing more about the galaxy's greatest comic as well as our news releases from uh the graphic novels and the treasury of british comics and until then earthlets it's been wonderful seeing you again and as always splendid verthrig So, uh, as I said, it's um, very strange to be interviewed on your own podcast. Uh, but uh, and, and this is going to be very strange because I'm going to introduce the person who's going to interview me. <laughs> Should um, I be doing this part? I don't... I, I, um, no, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, so Graham McMillan, a friend of the Thrillcast... Uh, from 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 yesteryear and and you know supporter of 2000 AD and and journalist extraordinaire. Um, uh, thank you for agreeing to talk to me. <laughs> and thank you for agreeing to talk to me. I oh, guess it's, the, it's it's the, it's the strangest thing, right? I've done this before as a guest, and now <laughs> here I am interviewing you. I mean, you twisted my arm. Uh, you know, it, I. I, I Lord knows, I do. I look. I have questions. I genuinely have questions about this book. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be able to ask you them when you have to answer. I, mean, I, don't, um, I get to edit this. I don't have to answer. Anything. <laughs> Continue. Um, okay. I I've talked to you about this book a lot. I talked to you about this book when you were writing this book. Even. Mm, yeah. uh, but you know, I've never asked you, and, and I, I'm really curious about where did this book come from. I, what made you think I want to write? You know, I mean, this is where I say something complimentary, and you get very, you know, humble. But did you did you have the moment of going, I want to write the definitive book about Judge Dredd as a parable of actual real life modern policing? No, no. 
Um, so uh, the, the 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 actual idea for this book came out of the Judge Dredd mega collection um, back matter that I, I wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, the collection was 90, uh, 90 volumes, and and I think I had uh, interviews or features in in uh, 70, 80 of them. Yeah. Um, and a couple of those were, were really interesting. There, there, was, there was one I did on on um, aspects of authoritarianism, of of kind of hyper capitalism, of, of the destruction of democracy. Um, there was one where I compared uh, the uh, period just before Necropolis, where you've got the two kind of heirs apparent to Dread. You've got Kraken, who's his clone brother, son, yeah. Brother. Um, and uh, you've got Judge Giant, who's kind of his adoptive, uh, you know, the... it, he's who's kind of his kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I had compared that to, to to kind of the once once and future king, that kind of you know the the the, the one who's destined and the one who has it by rights and all, and all something. Anyway, um, so I finished that, and then uh, uh, my boss Ben, amongst others, um, suggested you know, why don't you turn this into a book? And I, I kind of, yeah, yeah, why not? Why not, I guess? Um, I, uh, In my head, I thought, well, I've already written it. Because I've... Oh, oh, Michael. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, reader, let's see how that turned out. Um, and uh, so then I, I submitted a pitch in 2020 uh, in the middle of, like, second lockdown, I think it was, um, and started work. Mm-hmm. The thread of the book um, about uh, exactly what you say, you know, a parable of modern policing, of, of law and order politics, really didn't start becoming apparent until uh, after, what, I think maybe seven or eight months of, mm-hmm. of research and a bit of writing as well. Um, and that was because I, 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 I was being guided by what I was reading. You know, bear, bear in mind, you know, I pitched this book a month after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, and then, you know, you get months and months and months of BLM uh, protests. The Colston statue ends up at the bottom of the harbour of, of Bristol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think you you can't. And this is, you know, this is not necessarily uh, a, a, a perfect situation, but you, you kind of can't see that going on. And then write a book about a hardline, the satire of a hardline policeman from the future, without even considering those aspects. And and the the, the more I did it, the more I realised that this 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 was a, um, a contextualising of dread. What it, it, it wasn't, it's not comics criticism in, in of itself. You know, I'm I'm although I do um, analyse the the internal logic and and uh, of the strip and and what it does. It's much more setting it in the wider context you know what what does it say what about the history um around it um chimes with with the strip and you know how does it have how does the satire work so um that that's basically how the process happened um the book that has emerged is a product of the process as opposed to a product of a decision at the beginning <laughs> to create it okay can we talk about your research because your research terrifies me <laughs> I have I have seen quite how much you have read. I mean, there, there's there's you you even just what you reference in the text itself mm. is breathtaking. But I feel that again, I was talking to you when you were writing this book. I feel that your feelings about dread, about the book, about everything, were very deeply impacted by your research and that your research kept leading to more research and more research and more research. It it was a, I don't want to say a rabbit hole because, you know, you don't necessarily come out of a rabbit hole, but, you know, it did keep leading on to new things. And I think, you know, you talk about the, the research changed the book. I think the research changed how you thought about Dread as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Because um, I, I tried to be as critical as I could be. Um, not that I wouldn't have been uh, critical at all, but the more I read, the more things chimed with what I was reading. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I revisited all the case files and the angles and all this and the other. And 
uh, what emerged for me was that uh, a strip that I already thought was was fascinating was even deeper and more important than than even I had had realized before. Yeah. Um, because there's there's a line in the book where I said, you know, there comes a point when the strip goes from from predicting the future to being a record of what is happening. Yes, and that's what's terrifying about it. You know, it's 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 uh, you know the, the the I guess the subtitle of the book can be a little bit misleading. Um, the as the book went on, I just thought I, I I've actually got to start leaving stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's it's not a complete history of dread. It's also not a complete history of policing in the. In, in well, the it's UK. it's it's one book. You well, can't exactly, do those exactly. things in I've, one book. I've got, I've got bookshelves <laughs> behind me, absolutely stuffed with with uh, with books. Who uh, some of them tried to do that and and only kind of scratched the surface. So, um, I think uh, my my appreciation of of John and Alan, especially, um, deepened. Uh, over the over the course of the process, um, and I started to realise uh, how how strong and interesting and nuanced the satire is. Where it goes wrong, what it gets right, um, you know, its blind spots, um, and so yeah, I've 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 come out. Something with something that I already knew and loved, and actually just yeah, I love it even more. Now. It, it is all a, a, what it is a wonderful, uh, almost recontextualization of dread, especially the early years. You know, especially like those first, you know, ten fifteen years. There's so much that that uh, Wagner and Grant put in there that you don't as a reader even necessarily think about and then in this book you you pull it all out and say no 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 this was influenced by what was happening at the time this was predictive of things that would happen because as writers they were just like you know what you know what feels like the logical conclusion of this or in many cases the illogical conclusion <laughs> you know and then it turns out to be to be right like it's it's funny you know i i i was doing drock for for the podcast mm, yeah. for for three years um and i thought that i was at my my zenith of dread love and then you read this book and you're like dread's amazing yeah yeah and it, it, it uh, and i th i think to a degree this isn't criticizing anybody um the the story the co the context of of that those early years of the creation of dread mm -hmm. of, of the wider context um has been underserved um, so and and this this is partly because it's bound up in the collective narrative about the 1970s, uh, yes. which over focuses on the strikes, on the winter of discontent, um, and and I think actually, and this is what reading the work of people like Stuart Hall, the the the, the great British uh, sociologist uh, who wrote a, a book called Police in the Crisis in 1978. So only one year after Dread came out, uh, came out for the first time, um, the the actual narrative of the 1970s is this growing kind of reactionary law and order politics. Um, mm -hmm. and, and once I'd started to delve into that, I realised actually that's a far more important context for Dread. Mm -hmm. That that explains him far better than the fact that there were strikes. Um, and, and, and how, the, how much of that? How movie. much of that do you think was was in the conscious mind of you know of John and and Al and and Pat Mills and and you know the other everyone that was contributing at that point? I think I think it was a case of culture influencing culture because obviously the, the the most obvious influence is um, Dirty Harry. Yeah, um, yeah. But then you've also got the Sweeney, you've got Hill Street Blues, mm -hmm. you've got you've got um, the 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 vigilante cop genre. Yeah, the yeah. hard man culture of the UK yeah. in that time, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, it, you know it, that reflected a wider sense of crisis within liberal democracy um, and of Western capitalism, uh, and so figures of strength and um, action were uh, very in vogue at the time. Yeah. Um, so, I, I I think there was an awful lot of un unconscious, but but but. 
ultimately it was John who said, what this new comic needs is a cop. He need, you know, learned the lessons of writing, of creating and, and writing uh, One Eye Jack for Valiant. Um, and he was absolutely right. You know, and it's one of the interesting things, actually. Um, I don't necessarily go into it in detail in the book. Uh, the, the, this whole concept of copaganda, the, you know, the the, um, the 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 cop is now the ubiquitous figure in our yeah, yeah. Uh, in in our cultural output. Um, even if they're not a cop, they are acting as yeah, yeah, exactly within their context. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that that's a sea change. That's something that's happened over the lifetime of uh, of of. of the, the well over, over the, the the time frame of of my book um and uh as a consequence i i, I think dread stands out as uh as neil gaiman says the thing and the critique of the thing mm-hmm. whereas an awful lot of propaganda it's called propaganda for a reason um, yeah, exactly there know, is no critique <laughs> yeah you, you, you've always got to have the good cop even if it's a corrupt system um you know it, it you get a film like Serpico, for example, that deals very, I mean, it's based on real life, um, it deals very directly with why why the police corruption and whistleblowing. But ultimately, that's a narrative of the good cop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, there's, yeah. there's the guy looking into this because he, he can be trusted. Yeah, yeah. So um, I Dread turns all that on his head uh, and, and, and basically goes, well, um, what, what, what if the system, what if, what if it's all Dirty Harry's? Mm-hmm. from the top to the bottom and they can do what they want effectively yeah. uh, but they dress it up in this rhetoric of the law it doesn't matter mm-hmm. that um the law is uh one that ensures that it is impossible to be innocent you know there's there's that oh. wonderful uh, well there's that wonderful um pre-apocalypse war story where you know they perform a crime swoop on this guy's apartment and he's clean you know, there's... But, but that's unacceptable. Well, exactly. Like, like, like he's even <laughs> helpful about it as well. And then just goes, "No, this is this is suspicious. No, nobody's innocent." Um, so it, it's you know that, that I mean that, that's and that's just fascinating how how um, you you look at, at, at narratives of law and order of 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 crime of uh, situations when uh, people have been killed by the police um, mm. and. What law and order does is it, it creates this notion that nobody's innocent. You you are not innocent um, because you have been killed by the state. Yeah, and and also like it it creates a, a sort of an external objective right. Hmm. You know that like if the law if you did this against the law then that's inherently wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, and one of the great things about dread is I am the law is such a subjective statement. That is hijacking such an objective statement. Yeah, you know, and and I mean, so this is something that within liberal democracy, um, um, and with within liberalism, is this idea that the that the law is a fixed and immutable thing, um, that is objective, uh, and is a you know is a process, and and in order for for society to function, we must all follow the rule of law. Um, mm-hmm. so in theory, the law applies to everybody. Even though it doesn't, um, <laughs> and uh, so you 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 have this vision when he says, "I am the law." You kind of go, "Well, the, yeah, the law's the law is good because that's how society." Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the law. Yes. Yeah. But when when he says, "I am the law," um, he's not saying it in the kind of um, the cowboy way. You know, where, <laughs> where he's he's got a bad. He's, like, he's, you know, yeah, he's not standing up for an objective truth. He's not no. an elected individual. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he he embodies the law. He, 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 well, he doesn't just embody the law. He, he he creates the law. You know, it's happened multiple times in the strips when he's just decided, yeah, 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 no, I'm going to change the law because of this circumstance. And, and you know, I go into the book um, about the Security of the City Act, mm-hmm. um, which is used repeatedly um, in the strips so the judges can effectively do whatever they want. And that's the foundation of their power. Um, and, and this is where I just beautifully chimes with with uh, all the, the the criminology and sociology i was reading over the last 50 years there's been this process of securitization where um all the functions of the state have gradually become functions of policing um mm-hmm. and I, I i describe in the book the the the, the judges can uh, control everything from from welfare to warfare um mm-hmm. 
and so uh, you, you know you, you you have a system where we talk about food security and energy security and uh, war becomes an issue of of policing colonialism is an issue of police you know a, 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 a world in which the police are the predominant force in society because all politics is policing and all policing is politics um i mean that that's just dread <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you know it's not in you go, oh my god yeah absolutely uh it's funny that you you mentioned you know the you mentioned liberal democracy and, and in talking about this i'm thinking about the strip democracy or revolution i think where where chief judge silver just says i write like on this one you write the law hmm. you know and it makes the subtext text if at yeah. any point anyone had missed it until that point you have I mean, a character outright saying that, that you was... can do whatever you want yeah, that that was um, one of the one of the one of the things that had kind of bugged me for for a very long time because I'd 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 seen people over the years and I'd done it as well, you know, looking at that moment and going, well, this is this isn't character. Dread doesn't break the law. Like, this is uncharacteristic. Mm-hmm. And I I I many years ago, I'd even seen somebody saying like we should exclude revolution from canon because it's just so uh, completely wrong. Um, but but as, as I make clear in the book, Silver isn't saying to Dredd, you can break the law. He's reminding Dredd that he has all the power to do whatever yes. he wants. Yes. Um, he's he's literally just, em- yeah, he's yeah. emphasizing. Yeah. So when he like, says, we, you know, we, de- we decide what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. So, so when a man says, you know, I am the law, he means I can, I write the law. That's, that's, that's how that works. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's fascinating when you look at things like the policing bill in the UK, um, where not only are the police being given greater powers um, to decide what is not what is and is not acceptable, but the Home Secretary um, is giving themselves statutory power to say what is and isn't acceptable. Yeah. Um, and that's an abrogation of democracy. That's, uh, you know, as, as imperfect a system as democracy is. Um, you know, and you, you, you kind of can't, I I personally don't think you can look at that and come to any other conclusion as regards dread. And, and I, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a particularly radical point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised at the, as you said, like it's not exactly pressing, but like there there is an incredible amount of parallel between dread and and the real world, yeah. and and I don't think it's always intentional, for want of a better way of putting it. No, I, it... I think I think at times Wagner and Grant and and you know and Ennis and and you know Gordon Rennie and and all the writers are taking things to again maybe not logical extremes, but like illogical extremes. They're extrapolating what's there, and then reality will. F- follow it sometimes very quickly afterwards yeah. it's it's all about insight and um you know you you you, you look at the that uh, wonderful i think it was a sunday telegraph feature um, back from the early 80s when um uh, titan were launching the, the the eagle comic reprints in the states and you know there's this, there's this image of of john and alan sat on beanbags on alan's very drafty floor um in uh, in the kind of you know east anglian countryside and they're just going through the papers and that process was one by which effectively they were just making each other laugh mm-hmm. um but in doing so what they were identifying were the underlying sinews of the stories that yeah. they were looking at um and that's that's why this character has such longevity i think um because it's not dealing in surface detail it's not dealing in surface parody it is turning things all the way up i, I think i think rob williams said this to me uh, ages ago like the, the key to a good dread story is to take a take something from the news or an idea or whatever turn it all the way up to 11 and then knock it down to 10 <laughs> you, you just break it and then, uh, and then go okay. How do we pull it back a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. So that so that you know, it's not just wild that it makes some kind of logical sense. Um, and I, 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 that is what has made the strip last so long, um, and why it is so prescient. And I say in the book, it's not so much prediction as projection, mm-hmm. because it's um, there's there's, there's a, a a great uh, um, 
quote at the at, at the start from the uh, Robocop director. Paul Verhoeven. No, not the director then. Screenwriter? <laughs> <Street Brighton? laughs> no, uh, uh, Neumeyer. I have the book right here. I'm good, I'm good to go okay. look. It's, it's on the first page. No, no it's not. Because that's first page right here. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the, no, <laughs> no. Inside, inside front cover. It's... Ed Neumeyer, who is the writer of Robocop, you're right. There you go. There you go. If you want to predict the future, just think about how bad it could be and make a joke out of it. Yeah. What a great quote. Exactly. Exactly. And, and how dread as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and so I, I knew I knew I had to put that in somewhere. Um and that's effectively the formula. And that and that and that and that's why Robocop owes so much to Judge Dredd, you know. It, 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 it's the dread formula. Well, pe- people share that image of of the um, the kind of uh, the the model of Robocop, but he's got a judge helmet on and go. Look, it was going to be a Judge Dredd film, but that's not what happened. That was um, that's kind of his interpretation of that photo. But uh, the producers had been looking to secure the rights to Dredd, so effectively mm-hmm. Robocop is Dredd with the the file the, the serial numbers filed off, <laughs> um, and. But you know, you got the black, you got the black humor. You've got the satire of of capitalism and uh, uh, and and law and order politics that produce this figure and all this and other. So uh, yeah, I I think um, uh, I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> I'm going to ask a different question in that okay. case. Uh, the professionalism. This is why you normally interview and don't get interviewed. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. Um, what was the most surprising thing you found in your search? Like, what was the thing that that really tweaked where you what you were thinking about the book? Hmm. Because again, your research process was months long, and you read a library's worth of books. Yeah, and and uh, research papers, and, and mm-hmm. you know, um, that when, and everything. Yeah, well, one of, one of the joys of living in Oxford is that you can become a reader at the Bodleian. Um, I think it's like thirty quid a year, and. Uh, you can, when when you use their Wi-Fi, you can get access to to um, JSTOR, which is the the oh, yeah. Um, yeah. papers thing for free. So uh, you know that was a big help because um, those things cost a fortune. But um, yeah, it, it, it what's the what was there one was there one thing or even a couple of things that really did? Because again, I you know I was talking to you during the writing of the book, and there were there were points where you had this moment of actually everything I've been thinking, I've got to flip it on its head mm-hmm. because I've just read this thing and it's, it's sent me in a different direction. I mean, the, the, I guess the, the, the two key ones, um, an early one was uh, I read a, a report by the Transnational Institute, which is a, um, a think tank uh, that deals with um, issues of globalization and, and uh, transnational uh, politics. <laughs> And they uh, they brought out a report called um, A Walled World, um, which is about the proliferation of militarized borders uh, around the world. And uh, I immediately just thought of Cal's, Judge Cal's Great Wall built in yeah. three weeks around the entire city to keep people in. Um, and the more I interrogated that story the more i i did the research on on militarized borders and whatnot i realized that there's just huge connections uh, and and i'd read um greg grandin's uh the end of the myth um <clears throat> a, a perfect surprise winning um book which uh talks about the american frontier as this constantly outward re- outwardly rolling yeah, yeah. a zone of violence and and exploitation and how in 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 his estimation, Trump signaled the return of the frontier back to America. So now America is the border is everywhere in America because you know um, ICE can can operate pretty much as as they wish in uh, most major American cities. Um, so uh, that that was that was a moment when all the pieces kind of slotted together, um, yeah. and and uh, it just kind of. Uh, Highlighted to me that, that I was on the right the right path. Um, 
the other thing was uh, necropolitics. Now, this is quite, I'm, I'm not going to try and explain it in a couple of sentences. It's quite a, um, uh, an intense. You, you don't want to deal with like a, a such a heady subject in, <laughs> in like two minutes on a podcast. In, in this cheery podcast. Go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's it, it's effectively about the the, the state using the uh, the power of life, uh, uh, death over life, um, and deciding who lives and who dies. So, you know, we've come out of a pandemic in which um, large sections of the population have effectively been abandoned by the state um, in various ways. Um, you know, uh, an almost kind of eugenicist attitude prevails in some sections of society the, the you know um if you fall sick then it's your own fault and yeah we shouldn't help you um alongside that you uh, there's a there's a a brilliant book called comic book crime um which is predominantly about um superheroes um but that discusses the concept of death worthiness um and how uh, superheroes decide themselves who deserves to live and who deserves to die. Yeah. Um, of course, in Dread, that's kind of, again, that's ramped up to 11 because he is literally um, somebody who, who, you know, he's not like a superhero where they're punching people. Oh, no, no. This is, it's... Back up again. He's literally killing yeah. people. Um, yes, and also it's literally his job. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, rereading uh, Question of Judgment, the um uh the the first of the triptych um you know question of judgment the case for treatment um and um uh the other one you're on your own i i i was like case for <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm just gonna cut that out um <laughs> and uh you know you, you you have the situation where dread is questioning i could have subdued somebody rather than shoot mm -hmm. them and uh he, he you know he goes to judge morph his mentor and morph says oh, you, know, you don't want to dwell on this stuff it'll just drive you crazy just get some tight boots and yeah you'll spend, you'll spend where, all where your boots are size too small yeah yeah and then you get this wonderful metaphor that wagner uses again and again and again um to indicate dread's micro gaze so his gaze is always micro. He's, he's, down, he's always looking down at his feet. He's, any time he looks up, he gets a kind of psychological vertigo where he kind of realizes what he's doing. Um, you know, so so uh, stories like a letter from Judge Dredd, a uh, letter to Judge Dredd, rather, um, uh, all the lead up to Necropolis. Um, yeah. The, uh, the, the you know the stuff around even stories like Wilderlands, um, and what happens after origins and and uh, yeah exactly when when fargo comes back and and it's yeah. again makes the subtext text yeah exactly exactly yeah. um and he just uh, that again that just all clicked into place but i think i think i think the the moment that that uh nearly well it didn't nearly have me in tears it did have me in tears because it was just so perfect and it was just happenstance that i i i, I not uncovered it, not, not like I'm the first person to ever realize it, but um, you know, for me, uh, you're, you're an archaeologist, you're a cultural oh, yeah, archaeologist. Absolutely. I mean, I'm in, I'm in Diana Jones, um, but uh, was when I realized that um, the first episode of Kids Rule OK in action, mm -hmm. uh, which was one of the you know, was one of the final nails in the coffin of action and and uh, cr created this, you know, this, helped create this big controversy around it. Uh, hit the streets the Saturday after the Notting Hill riots in, um, uh, in 1976. Like, it was, yeah. I, 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 like, like, yeah, like, like I, it was a product of it. I had to check it so many times. Like, uh, there's some <laughs> John Freeman from, from down the tubes, um, like I, I had to deal with numerous emails from me just going, have I got this right? Have I got this right? Yeah. This yeah. Right? Was this actually the date? Yeah. Because if it is, if, if I have got it right, this is perfect. And, uh, it, it, you know, as far as we can tell, it, 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 it is, it is correct. So, um, you know, that's when all those kind of threads kind of marry together and, and you realize there's, there's a narrative there. Yeah. Um, between uh, comics and, and wider society. 
Well, especially, I don't say back in the day, but I kind of do want to say back in the day. Like, the, there was a uh, comics were a part of the mainstream pop culture mm. conversation. You know, especially when you look back at the early days of 2000, or action, you know, just before that, where they were taking all the information in and putting it back out. Mm. You know, aggro is a way of life is the perfect slogan for basically like, you know, punk, which came along, you know, months after that. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, 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 and defined the generation. Well, it, it, it's, no? it's, it's interesting that um, it's in the gap uh, from when. Um, Action got pulped, yeah. Uh, through to when it reemerged as it, in its mm-hmm. muted form. In in that space, in that absence, is when um, uh, the Sex Pistols' first single came out, and when they were on the Today, uh, 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 is it, uh, the Today, it's show, the Today with, Show, isn't it? With, yeah, um, uh, with uh, Bill Grundy. Bill Grundy. That's right. My brain was screaming Frank Boff, but that's another um, <laughs> thing to do with with action. Um, you know, and so it. it 2008 came along at exactly the right moment, and this, and this this is what I talk about in the book. Is 2008 wasn't a punk comic, you know, it wasn't produced by punks. No, but it it, it, it understood it, punk it, in a way that shared, very few things are. Yeah, yeah, it it it, it shared a common root, you know, a dissatisfaction, um, a, re, a a rebellion against the status quo, um, and the fact that they came along together is really fitting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think ultimately, uh, and again, I go into this in in, uh, in in a little bit in the book. Um, 2080's success is it learned how to um, craft and temper that rebellion to create something that endured, rather than going out in a great big blaze of burnt out, fiery yeah. glory. Um, you know, even even early dread, he he is. Uh, uh, so you know, uh, Pat's especially Pat's Judge Dread is is an apocalyptic figure. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he you can't have the kind of escalation of the cursed earth forever. <laughs> yeah, he's fighting dinosaurs for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> there were flying rats, you know, and and you know, Jimmy Carter was on the bloody Mount Rushmore. Um, that's going to end with a bang or a whimper, either way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, 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 what John's genius, uh, was, was to understand how a character like that can endure. And, um, he understood that uh, he, he couldn't just be a lone gunfighter the whole time. He couldn't yeah. be Dirty Harry. He had to be part of a system. Um, and so you, you, you begin to see a gradual shift towards, uh, and this is quite gradual and quite subtle. Uh, the other judges being less shit. To put it to put it subtly. To put it subtly. I mean, fairly early on in the strip, uh, there's one or two moments when the the other judges are just rubbish. Like they're, <laughs> they're cowards or they're idiots or like even even um, even block wall. You know, like like coming. Um, uh, straight out of uh, uh, well, uh, um, uh, straight out of the, um, the, the the judge child, the judge child saga. Yeah, again, my brain was screaming Judge Calvary. It wasn't. It was Judge Child saga. Um, uh, you know, Dread turns up, and like oh, no, the other judges, judges are basically like, kind of waving God. His hands and just saying yeah. desist, desist. You know, bloody <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. But you know. It, it, Dread's always got to be the exemplar. He's always got to be uh, mm. the best of the best of the best in in, in order for for for, uh, for him to, to to work as a character, um, and in doing so, he 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 is that that liberal notion of the policeman that the, um, with enough tinkering, with enough training, with enough science, um, with enough reform, you can eventually get the perfect policeman mm-hmm. who's fair to everybody. And uh, what you end up with is a brutal tyrant. Who murders billions of people? But you know what? I, I, I'm going to. I, I'm aware that like we've been doing this for like half an hour, and I'm, I'm going to bring it to a close soon. But just this, you know, you talked about the really slow evolution of dread, mm. and like dread has become, you know, across the last three decades at this point now, has become not softer in any way, but he's become a much more nuanced character. Yeah, 
you know, he he's become much more aware of his complicity in a system that he himself doesn't believe in, but he still I was going to say happily upholds. He upholds. He doesn't do anything happily. Um, you know, it, it's it is a really interesting thing to say. You know, you're talking about tinkering. Mm. You know, and one of the things I lo- I love about the book is that you are very aware of the strip's missteps. But also that the strip is in a way self reflective and self repairing, you know. So yeah, I I, th- I think you see the strip address its own mistakes mm-hmm. if you wait long enough. Dread as a strip is a strip that rewards patience like nothing else, <laughs> you know, because it is. Dread is going to do callbacks. Something that happened twenty years ago, and you'd be like, oh wait, is this? Oh, it is. And I don't know how much of that is, you know. Someone like a, a Rob Williams remembering something they've read, or honestly, something like John Wagner thinking, "Now oh, wait, I've had this idea that I guess it connects back to something I was doing thirty odd years ago." Um, but how do you feel about Dreads? Uh, again, I don't want to say softening, but his his maturation into something that is not just the you know the the fascistic you know, judge, jury, and executioner that he was when he first appeared. I mean, he still is that. <laughs> let's, sure, let's but, he, but, but, I, but again, I, no, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to let it, he, he's a cuddly <laughs> yeah, old no. man now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, no, I, I, I absolutely get with you, and, and you're right, he is a lot more nuanced than than uh, he, he used to be as a character. Um, and I think, uh, uh, for me, again, I touched on this in the book, um, that reflects the uh, the cycles of reform and failure that we see mm-hmm. in the police. Uh, I mean, this is, as always, this is particularly acute in America, but we must never let the contrast between the British and American police let the British system off the hook. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, things are just very extreme here. In well, a way yeah. that I think, I think they're <laughs> bubbling onto the surface in the UK sometimes, and in America, they can be. Um, I mean, Less, it, so. you, 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 it, it, it's it's when you kind of come out of the of the last few years, and there's another report saying there are problems with racism, and you know, the McPherson report was twenty odd years ago, and the the Scarman report was twenty years before that, um, and that's that that's what I mean by these kind of cycles of reform. You know, mm-hmm. we'll fix it, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. But then problems remain, and then nothing happens, and yeah, yeah. Um, and as a consequence, I, I think during during that same kind of time frame, dread has come uh, has has come to more accurately uh, represent the uh, the contradictions of policing. Um, you know, I, I refer in the book to you know, the honest man who lies, the the fair man who brutalizes. Um, and what's notable about the last 20 years is the one time he actually tries to change the system for the better, and it's only a tiny change, Mm -hmm. he breaks the system. Yeah. Um, you know, he, 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 the, 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 the reform of the mutant laws is actually a fairly minor. Uh, tinkering with the system, but it almost brings and everything goes to hell. Yeah, yeah, and 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 arguably leaves the city vulnerable when the um the chaos bug, when the the soft revenge for the apocalypse war comes along with Day of Chaos. So um, you know, it, yes, he's he's aware of the of, of the limitations, but I think certainly over the the, the last twenty years, um, as a character, I think he he. Has as much learnt his own limitations, and writers have have understood uh, Dred's own limitations. So you know, you reference Rob Williams' stuff. He uh, his work um, starting with something like Titan is very much about pushing Dred to the limit. Yeah, you know, how 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 far do these notions of duty and uh, and fairness go um, when mm-hmm. you're dealing with a man? Yes, um, and and one of the things that Rob does really well, I think, is what is Dred is a man. Yeah. Like you get to see dread break for want of a better way of putting it. Yeah. But I think it's always a, a really interesting way to go. And you know, ultimately dread is is the is the symbol of the system. So as as long as dread stands, the system stands. So you know, there's there's that wonderful page 
of Henry Flynn's artwork in in uh, Day of Chaos, where you know the script's talking about you know, things are going to get worse, and tomorrow will be the same, and the day after will be the same, and you just got dread with his head. Uh, you know, you presume it's dread, but he's just got his head bowed and he's in shadow. That's a you know, that's a man whose spirit is broken, even if his yeah. will is not. Um, and so I, I I think that's that's been a fascinating evolution. And I, I, and I, and I think that actually allows some critics who don't aren't necessarily paying attention, aren't reading everything, to then dismiss him because you haven't got the bombast of mm. the early eighties. They um, they either presume that there's no satire in it anymore, or that. Um, the strip hasn't achieved anything, but I, I, I would argue over the past twenty odd years, the, the strip has achieved more than it ever has. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think if you look at, I've, I've been saying this. I think I said this in your Comic Con at the, the two thousand D panel. Hmm. Uh, I think Dread is like one of the crowning achievements of English language comics. Oh, uh, like if you, if you, if you, if, if you look across like the the forty six years now, like it's, it's done things that other comics just could not even conceive of. And it's it and it's done it in fits and starts. It's been inconsistent. It sure, has, sure. Um, contradicted itself, um, mm-hmm. but but ultimately the 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 core concept is so strong and so clever and so nuanced and has evolved in such a way that you have a character who can do any story you want. He can do war. He can do science fiction. He can do fantasy. He can do horror. Yeah, he can do broad comedy. He can, exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but at the same time, no matter what he does, there's always that critique mm-hmm. at the heart of it. So even when, yeah. it, even in the most silly of stories, you can, uh, you, you know, you, you, you get stories like, um, uh, was it paid with thanks? About the, the the woman who just sends bills to people, for yes, pay, yes. and they just pay them, and then um, she gets—I mean, spoilers—but she gets haunted by the ghosts of of um, uh, of uh, people whose families um, of of uh, uh, she's hounded, um, and uh, you know that's a critique of capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, you get something like the Lemming syndrome. Where citizens just start chucking themselves off the top of a of, of, of a city block, and you know that's uh, a, a, a well, that's a critique of the whole system um, yeah, that yeah. these people so psychologically damaged that they just throw themselves, uh, you know, to their death. <laughs> uh, and 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 that last panel where Dread basically goes, oh, well, we'll keep the, uh, well, we'll keep well, the yeah, what are you going to do? Handy. You know, yeah. oh, great, fantastic. <laughs> um, so you know, the system won't even 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 when the system knows that that something is wrong it won't fix it because actually to fix it would be to bring the whole thing down um yeah. and you know it's just uh, it, it is one of the crown achievements i i think he's he can easily stand alongside the greatest comic book characters ever you know he de- he deserves to be in oh the easily same, yeah same breaths as, as as any of them and john and alan deserve um Credit mm-hmm. uh, for you. You will uh, hear no disagreement from me on this. Well, I, I, and and you know, I've, I've said this on other podcasts. Deserve credit for creating modern comics. Yep. No 2000 AD. No Alan Moore. No Alan Moore. Yeah. No, no exactly. No, yep. No Vertigo. No, yeah. No Alan Moore. No. No. Basically, nothing in American comics in the last like 30 years for real. And and you yeah. know. The, it, it's a counterfactual, but those things may have happened anyway. But they wouldn't have happened in the same way. And I, I, I think ultimately it was uh, uh, Pat and John and Alan that blend of uh, black humor, of um, inventiveness, uh, of cynicism, oh, you but know, also the, of com- commentary in the world. Exactly, taking taking experience from outside of comics into comics. Yeah. So even you know. even when you get um, uh, creators, particularly working in American comics, who've never read 2000 AD, they're still working in a world created by 2000 AD. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's yeah. astonishing. Yeah, uh, and and I know I'm 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 paid to say that, but um, <laughs> I also believe it, uh, and have written a book about it effectively. Um, but yeah, it, it's it it's been so fascinating because um, as, as as we were talking about earlier. You know, I I went into this with Dread being my favorite comic book character, 
and he's still my favorite comic book character. But now I think he's he's possibly the most important comic book character in the world because no other character has has done this over that period of time um and continues to do it every single week and every single month in the magazine um you know without reboot without mm-hmm. restart mm-hmm. um and that's testament to, to to the genius of of those creators who are responsible for it really 